precious on mighty speed my heart you have won I bow down I bow down low and I thank you I thank you I thank you for all that you
morning, everybody. I want to welcome you here this morning. My name is Justin. I'm one of the worship leaders around here. Really glad to have you here, uh, part of this community, and just be able to see you and have you physically present with us this morning. As we continue to celebrate Advent this, uh, this week, uh, we're going to start this morning by having some songs of worship together. Uh, we'll light the Advent candle in just a little bit. Um, but continue to just come and remember our hope that we have in Jesus together. And as we do that, we're going to start with a couple songs. So I invite you to stand as you're able, and we'll open with a word of prayer. So Lord, we just say thank you for the opportunity to be together as a church community. And Lord, we just celebrate you this morning as we remember the gift that you have made for us by coming to rescue us, by coming to be present, by being God with us. God, we just lift up our, our eyes to you this morning, and we ask that you would have your, t- have your way in this time and place. We just welcome you in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a hunger in our hearts. We are waiting, waiting. Stirring in our souls, we are waiting, waiting for the Prince of Peace to come. Make straight the paths for him. There's a hunger in our hearts. We are waiting, waiting for the Lord. Waiting for the Justice flowing down. There's a sorrow in this hour. We are watching, watching for the Lord. We're watching for the Lord.
Lord, we just come with our expectation this morning, and especially as we are celebrating Advent. God, we look to you with hope and that expectation. So it is the third week of Advent, the third Sunday in Advent. And in church history, Advent is a season of waiting, of expectation, and of hope. In Advent, we remember how God's people longed for deliverance. They were looking to be delivered from evil and from oppression and their anticipation that God's kingdom would break in on their behalf. And so today we light the candle of joy. And as we do that, we're going to read from Luke chapter 2. And the angel said to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. And so, Lord, that is, our, that is our prayer of gratitude this morning as we come before you to just recognize and remember that you are the joy that we have looked for. We ask that you would continue to make that a reality in our lives this morning. Amen. We praise you, God. Friends, you're welcome to have a seat at this time. We're going to move forward with a time of announcements. Pete's going to bring those, and we'll continue in worship. Go, Pete. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday and Merry Christmas. My name is Pete. I am one of the pastors here. We are super glad that you are here as well. If you are visiting today, we are especially glad that you came. After the service, uh, Pastor Becca, our children and youth pastor, is going to be over by the Welcome Center. Stop by, say hi, pick up a free gift, and uh, have a chat. And we're just glad that you came. 
Uh, we have a purpose as a community. It is to help people love God, love people, and change the world. That's everything that we're about doing as a church. On Sundays, we have an opportunity to give toward that purpose. You can do so electronically using the instructions behind me, or you can put gifts in the connection card boxes. Whatever the case may be, we like to pray into this portion of the service. So God, we are uh, just super grateful. And I want to thank you today specifically for the Christmas season. For some of us, it's hard. For some of us, it's a joy. But for all of us, there's like more sign of your presence in the world. So many lights and trees and Christmas crosses and nativities. And I'm just grateful, God, that we have a season of generosity and celebration. And I pray that you would bring everybody a place to celebrate. Uh, we also give you thanks for Jesus, God. We want to give back to you as we do. We ask that you would turn our gifts into more people loving you here and outside our walls and around the world. Amen. Could you please take the connection card out of your program? We ask, would you please fill one of these out each week that you are with us? You can follow the link online if you're following with us online. At the end of the service, these go in the connection card boxes. If you're with us regularly, you can just put your name on the front. If you're visiting, give us whatever information you're comfortable giving. And on the back is the spot for prayer requests. Each week, the pastors and staff are praying for every request that we receive, and we want you to know there's people praying for you in your church. So let us know how to pray. And again, these go in the connection card boxes or just fill it out online. Uh, we have a important volunteer need that fits well with the holiday season. Uh, Loaves and Fishes is an organization that works with churches to serve food to people in communities where there is more than 10% food insecurity. And so we've had a long relationship with Loaves and Fishes, and we serve 170 to 200 meals four nights a week. And our chef, Mona, has been on medical leave, and that's going to continue for a little while. And the remaining volunteer team is handling it, but they're feeling pretty overwhelmed. And they asked, could they please get some help? And so Monday through Thursdays from 2 o'clock to 5.30, you can go online and sign up to help through the Loaves and Fishes website, or you can just show up and help. We're not looking for expert cooks. We're looking for someone willing to hold a scoop and go like this. And so you, whoever you are, could absolutely make a difference for the team. And so let us know on the connection card if you have any questions. Otherwise, just show up or sign up on the Loaves and Fishes website. Uh, Christmas Eve is coming forth with, that's going to be on a Sunday this year. And so there will be no morning services on Christmas Eve. All right, so do not come to morning service on Christmas Eve. You will be disappointed with the locked door. That said, we will have our Christmas Eve services at 3 o'clock and 4.30. There will be carols and scripture and candlelight and a celebration of Jesus' birth. Then on Christmas Day, we're an unusual church. We always have a service on Christmas Day. That will be at 10.30. That's right. My favorite Christmas happens to be here. And then we're going to serve dinner to anybody who comes. The Christmas Day service will not have child care, but it's a very family vibe. Don't have any worries about bringing your kids. There will be activity packs for them as well. The Christmas Day dinner will be at noon. If you do not have a place to go for Christmas with people that you love, join us here at noon. We have a holiday feast, and it's going to be great. If you're going to do that, let us know on your connection card. We like to try to cook for the right number of people, but like the last couple times have been 240 people. And so... Anyway, just getting that count is super helpful. Um, we need donations to help make this happen. The specific donations we're looking for are cooked hams and turkeys dropped off on Christmas Day between 10 and noon. It would be so helpful to us if you could do that. And then homemade Christmas cookies. We try to send everybody who comes home with a wrapped uh, plate full of mixed Christmas cookies. If you want to bring Christmas cookies, we have this amazing refrigerator called Minnesota. If the building's locked, you just set them on the ground, make sure they're covered, and we will get them and serve them to somebody the week of Christmas. All right. Um, we have some other needs for volunteer help on Christmas Day, one of which is really important to me personally. We need things like people to set up and decorate, people to work in the kitchen and on the buffet line. And I just want to talk about cleanup helpers. Um, Gay often stays on Christmas Day until like she's the last person out of the building. And by last, I mean just like an hour in the kitchen by herself. And this year she's not coming on Christmas Day because we're down a pastor and she's taking Christmas Eve and it's me on Christmas Day. And I would love help in the kitchen. 
I am not a do it alone for an hour on Christmas Day person. And so if you're willing to help, I love you. Uh, just let us know on your connection card and that will be glorious. Last opportunity is a big one. Um, I'm gonna start a little bit in reverse of what's written here. On February 2nd and 3rd, we're gonna have Jordan Sang, who wrote a book called Miracle Work, out here for a conference. Uh, we used this book for a training here and a prayer class, and it was awesome and very well received. And so we read it for our theology pub. That's a group where we read a book once a month and talk about it at a pub. You are welcome at Theology Pub. Check the bookstore for details. Although they're missing today, they're usually back there. Um, we loved this book. It's about what we can do to be more ready to be used by God for miraculous work. And so we decided, let's try to get in touch with this dude. And we did, and we've been telling people, and now we have folks coming from Chicago, Duluth, and all the vineyards in the Twin Cities. And so I don't want you guys to miss it, February 2nd and 3rd. We are in preparation for that conference, going to offer our Miracle Work prayer training on Saturday morning, January 13th, from 9 to 12.30. It's awesome. It's, I think it's great whether you're brand new to faith or whether you've been following Jesus for some ridiculous number of years. Uh, I just think it's going to be real helpful if you want to come. And so let us know on your connection card if you'd like to be there for the class. That's January 13th, a Saturday at 9 a.m. All right, middle schoolers, you've got middle church. That's grades 6 through 8, or if you feel like you're in grades 6 through 8, out through the doors in the back. And why don't you take a moment, say hi to someone near you. Becca's going to come deliver the message forthwith. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Holly. Good morning. I have to put my uh, my sermon back in order because first service I flipped it and now it's all backwards. Yay! But I think I got it. Good morning and welcome. My name is Becca Bunger and I am the youth and children's pastor here at River Heights Vineyard. Thank you. I'm actually really, really excited to be like right here today because I don't get to be up on this stage much. Usually on Sunday mornings, I'm downstairs with the kids. And then the bulk of the preaching I do is actually on Wednesday nights over in the La Vina Sanctuary because that's where youth group meets. So I don't usually get to be here. So I'm really excited that I get to be here with you this morning. I love the Christmas series. I've been really enjoying it. Uh, my husband, Chris, and I stumbled upon our new favorite Christmas classic, Klaus, while we were looking for a movie to watch with our girls. Klaus is on Netflix. We saw it had gorgeous animation, but we missed that it was PG. Um, so depending on where you stand on casual cartoon violence, if you have kids, you might want to wait till they're a little older than four and two. But our kids turned out fine and they love the movie. It starts with the lead character, Jesper. He's a selfish, rich kid floating his way through his dad's business, the Postal Service. His dad sends him to the roughest town and it's a place where no other postman has ever succeeded in getting the postal service started. The town, Samirinsburg, is literally on the farthest corner of the map. Jesper needs to get 6,000 letters sent within the year or he'll be cut off from his dad's fortune. My kid's using the door as a mirror right now. <laughs> um, Smearinsburg is a cold, foggy fishing village. The houses are falling apart and they have weapons sticking out of them. Smearinsburg is split between the Ellingbows and the Crumbs. Think the Montagues and the Capulets or the Hatfields and the McCoys. 
And because this is a kid's movie, the Ellingbows have brown hair and the Crumbs have red hair, so you can tell them apart. <laughs> and heads up, this clip is where the casual violence gets a little less casual. So later we meet Miss Alva, who can't teach because the Ellingbows won't send their kids to school if the crumbs are attending. And the crumbs won't send their kids if the Ellingbows can. And so she turns the school into a fish market so she can earn enough money to get out of town. Jesper sees crumbs throw chamber pots on freshly laundered sheets. He sees Ellingbow kids pick and eat all the berries from a crumbs yard every morning. And Jesper visits hundreds of houses asking for letters, but they have no use for sending mail when they don't care about each other. So finally, Jesper finds a scribbly little picture dropped by a lonely kid. And he convinces the kid to mail it only 5,999 to go. At a secluded house in the woods, Jesper gets startled when he sees a large man with a huge white beard, Klaus. He runs away, dropping the first letter. Klaus opens it, and an isolated old man sees a lonely child. And it just so happens that Klaus has a workshop filled with toys. That night, Klaus tracks Jesper down to help deliver his first toy.
the next day, that little Ellingbow boy is playing with his toy. It hops to the fence where a little chrome girl is watching with eyes filled with wonder. The two kids start playing together, and when they're caught, they're educated by their elders in the long tradition of why they hate the other family. But hope and joy have entered the story. If you write a letter to Klaus, he'll send you a toy. The kids don't know how to write, so Jesper sends them to Miss Alva, and they beg her to teach them. Jesper starts getting more letters and starts delivering a lot more toys with Klaus. And there are some kids who are just really mean to Jesper, so he gives them coal. And then he tells them that if they want toys, they got to be nice. They got to be good. And most of the kids start being kind to each other, to their parents, and to their neighbors, even if their neighbors are Ellingbows or Crumbs. And that gets their parents involved. And over time, the community itself is transformed. This is a beautiful secular retelling about how Santa Claus got his start. And I didn't even spoil all the plot points. You're going to love this movie. I love how the success of the entire plot hinged on Klaus seeing a child who had a need for a moment of joy. He couldn't fix the breaking down houses, a violent generational family feud, or even his own loneliness. But he had a toy. He didn't know that he would change the entire town of Smearinsburg by helping that one child. Helping that one child was enough. This reminds me of a story in the Old Testament. This is after King David, and Israel has been divided into the northern kingdom, Samaria, and the southern kingdom, where Jerusalem is, called Judah. And in 2 Kings, we see three of Judah's kings, Hezekiah, Manasseh, and Josiah. 2 Kings 18 through 20 shows us that Hezekiah is one of the best kings Judah has ever had. But then in chapter 21, his son Manasseh is described as the worst king that Judah ever had. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother was Hephzibah, and he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. Manasseh rebuilt a lot of the shrines and altars that his father Hezekiah had torn down. And though Manasseh was the worst king that Judah ever had, chapter 22 said Josiah was another one of the best kings that Judah ever had. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah from Bozkath. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. When Josiah turned 12, he started tearing down the shrines and altars to foreign gods. He sent money to restore the temple. And in restoring the temple, the high priest discovered an old scroll that was a law of Moses. And he gave it to Josiah. When Josiah read that scroll, he felt dismay because the people had not been following the Lord. In response, he had the entire book read to all of Judah. The rest of the shrines and altars to foreign gods were torn down, and he made sure that the people would celebrate Passover again. Huh. So let's spend some time in holy wonder about this. Why did Manasseh and Josiah end up so different? One was the worst king, and one was one of the best. Their first years look very similar on paper. They were both young princes who grew up in the same palace. 
They both lost their fathers way too early. Manasseh was 12. Josiah was 8. What was the difference? The Bible doesn't say. But I'm a children's pastor. And here is what I think. I think someone saw Manasseh as a young ruler to be trained in the ways of state. And I think someone saw Josiah as a child who would need to know God in his life. I love the 4 to 14 movement. They're a group who focuses on evangelism to children. They found that children who are introduced to God between the ages of 4 and 14 are more likely to have a lifelong faith. And if you were introduced to God between the ages of 4 and 14, raise your hand. Yeah. Now, to be very fair, you can decide to love God back at any age, and God is going to be overjoyed that you chose to love him back. You are still God's beloved child, whatever age you decided to believe at. And as a young child, Lou Sari taught me about Jesus with puppets and Happy Meals. As a third grader, Nancy Head prayed with me at summer camp. At teen camp, Carrie Watson Hiller was one of my counselors, and we got to go full circle because I went back to that camp as a speaker for the last two summers, and I taught her teens. <laughs> I'm a 4 to 14 kid. They found that even kids who are introduced to God at that age, who decide not to believe or who later walk away, they are more likely to return in their adulthood if they had a good experience when they were young. So whether you believed right away as a child or not, who here remembers the name of someone who introduced you to God in that age range? Let's honor those names. If you'd like, say it to someone around you. Polly Hubbard also was there. She was great. Childhood is important. Children are important. When you change the life of a child by introducing them to the love of Christ, you change the entire world. Every interaction that child has for the rest of their life has the potential to be infused with greater love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That changes the world. And you could be one of those names. If you are serving in Vineyard Kids or with Vineyard Youth, you probably already are. And I love doing this stuff with you. And I'm going to just take a moment to thank you again. Can everyone just give these people a moment? Because wow. Loki, I would love to add a second pre-K service at first service and another one at third service. If you want to come and hang out with some of the best kids in town, you can sign up on your connection card for one service, one Sunday a month. Oh, also, check out this picture. This is of our middle church room. I snapped this picture about a month ago. The number of teens we have is also growing. Do you? Yeah, right? These are some of the best teens in town. I see you. I see you right there. All right. Do you know that four of five graduating seniors intend to keep going church, but only two to five do? And the number one determining factor of the young adults who keep attending church is whether or not they're serving on a team as a high schooler. They felt more connected to their community. So if they stayed in town, they stayed in their church. And if they left town, they sought new churches so they could be in community. Have you seen all of our teens on a Sunday? I'm trying to get all of them serving. It is so awesome. Is there one on a team that you're already serving on? Do you 
want to help them learn how to greet, to make coffee, to sprinkle confetti on a craft in a way that you don't have to vacuum afterwards. Like, they need to see how you live out your faith. Teens these days, this generation, they try their faith on like a sweater. They see what is happening. They copy what they see, and they try it on. If it works for them, then they try belief. They answer the question, where do I belong, before they believe. Belonging comes first. Your presence, the attention that you give to them, how you live out your faith, it matters. We're being auditioned. I'm a theater person. This is exciting. Speaking of teens, we had a fundraiser today. Thank you for eating a donut if you got the chance. We're raising money for a 55-passenger bus because we have more than fit in our River Heights bus. We're trying to get 16, we have $1,600. We're trying to get to 4,000 and we have a month left. So back to the sermon. All right. In 2015, Harvard Center for the Developing Child released a study that stated every child who winds up doing well has at least one stable, committed relationship with a supportive adult. By the time you shift from children's pastor books to youth pastor books, the number changes from at least one to six. Every teen needs six adults investing in their lives. And they need us because life is hard for children too. They also face divorce. They also face addiction. They also face the death of loved ones. They face hunger and homelessness, depression and anxiety. And these are all things that children and youth in our church experience. This is Elam. He was having a rough day and asked for a hug. He didn't let go. Minutes in, Elam whispered, it's working. <laughs> he was starting to feel better, more grounded, less anxious. My five-year-old was hit in class three weeks ago by her friend, Danny. That's weird because Danny is usually really sweet. The next week, his teacher noticed more throwing and more hitting behavior, but also that his sister mentioned something about mom being gone. So I checked in. His mother died three months ago. They just started coming back to church. Danny doesn't have behavior. Danny has grief. Since then, I talked to his teachers about ELR, extra love required. My youngest and I pray for her friend because sometimes sadness can look like anger and Danny is very, very sad. Last week, we saw them coming in to check in downstairs and we said, Danny, we're so glad to see you here. And he and his sister ran to us and gave us the biggest hugs. We're going to get him through this. And Jesus is helping get him through this through us, right? So here is a look at Smearinsburg towards the end of the movie.
it's Christmas. We're celebrating that God came to earth. The kingdom of God broke through into our world in the form of a tiny baby in Bethlehem. Jesus came to stand with us and to take our sin and brokenness to the cross. God could have popped Jesus down as a 26-year-old with a fully formed prefrontal cortex. But he didn't. He started as a kid because God wants children to know that he can help them too. Klaus saw a child hurting and gave that child joy. It changed Smearensburg. Someone saw Josiah, a child grieving, and introduced him to God, and it changed a nation. In the vineyard, we like to talk about bringing the kingdom. And when we see children and introduce them to God, we bring God's kingdom here. Jesus says, whoever welcomes one of, my little, one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but also the Father who sent me. I want to see more God in this world. And when we introduce children and teens to God, we bring God into their lives and we change the world. So I have some steps for you. And I'd love to invite the worship team to come back up and the prayer team to be ready to pray for people today. So step one, notice. Don't turn and look right now, but see the children and youth in the sanctuary. If they aren't with their teachers downstairs, then they need you to see them up here sitting with their families. Step two, talk. Don't get discouraged by one word answers. Relationships take time. Oh, and also talk about things that they have control over. Interests like unicorns, books, football. Everyone's got an opinion on Bigfoot. <laughs> we'll leave a bit, we'll leave like physical features alone, like height, beauty, or eye color. Bigfoot. Three, pray for God's eyes to see opportunity and speak life into these young people. And bonus tip four, serve with kids, either down in Vineyard Kids or with a kid upstairs on a team. There are people up here on the prayer team who would love to pray with you about anything, but I did have a few ideas for today. One, I said that children are important, but I never said that having children is important. So if God called you to singleness, or if God called you to marriage but not to be a parent, you can bring God's kingdom. Get prayer for anything you want. If God called you to parenthood, but you are waiting and it is hard, I am so sorry. God sees you. God loves you. You can bring God's kingdom. Get prayer for anything you want. If you are grieving this holiday season for whatever reason, please come get prayer. And if you want the eyes to see opportunities to bring the kingdom here, or if you want prayer for anything else, please come get prayer. I'll start. Holy Spirit, come. Help us to partner with you in bringing as much of your kingdom here to this world as we can. Give us your eyes to see and give us your hope for what can be when we get to work with you. We love you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand again as we're able. And we're going to sing a couple more songs together. And also in the middle of that, have the opportunity to take communion together. I just want to invite you to, as we, as we sing this next song, invite you to kind of pay attention to the words. I know that sometimes it's easy to start singing songs, and as we do here sometimes, and the words just kind of go by. 
But as we celebrate uh, Jesus and the, this idea of lo us looking with expectation and the hope that we have in him, in that, in the way that he came to meet us, as we talked about this morning, that he came to meet us exactly where we're at. Sometimes it's, I think it's helpful for us to just take a moment and think about what did that mean? What did it mean that he did that for us? And what did that actually look like? took off your glory, you dressed up in frailty just to come near. You made yourself nothing, as low as a servant, and you came near. You were obedient, living a life of a law. You were obedient even to death on a cross. Jesus, you have a name above all names. Let it rise to the highest place. Everyone sing. Took off your glory, dressed up in frailty just to come near. You made yourself nothing, as low as a servant. just acknowledge you, Jesus. So one of the ways that we do that each week is to celebrate communion together as a church family. There are two tables up front this morning and one in the back. And these tables have the elements of 
unleavened bread and juice on them. And these elements signify Jesus' sacrifice for each of us. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks. He gave it to them and he said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. It's through Christ and with Christ and in Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. You can go back to the Lord's table anytime during these next two songs.
is my company. shepherd I have all I need you lead me to water and comfort me with peace the Lord is my shepherd I have all I need lead me to water and comfort me with peace wherever I go all that I know 
find safety in your presence. The world can go, I'll stay by your side. Wherever I go, wherever I go, all that I know is I find safety in your presence. The world can go, I'll stay by your side. The world can go. The world can go, I'll stay by your side. The world can go, I'll stay by your side. The world can go, I'll stay by your side. to know that you are here among us. We are grateful for all that you are doing here. And so as we close our service this morning, Lord, we ask that you would continue to go with us out into this coming week. Would you bless our coming and going? Would you go alongside us and meeting us in those places where there is joy and where there is sorrow and everything in between? God, we are grateful that you are truly the God that is with us. And so we say thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to continue and play another song. If you want to hang out and do that with us, that would be awesome. If you need to get going, we understand that as well. Really great to have you here with us this morning. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. But again, reminder, there is no church services in the morning next week. So next Sunday is Christmas Eve, and we'll be having our uh, two afternoon services. Uh, we would love to see you there. Uh, and in the meantime, I hope you have a very blessed week. Thank you for being here. Justice flowing down There's a sorrow in this hour We are watching, watching for the Lord We're watching for the Lord
It's coming.